Hello friends, I'm Dave Layton, and thank you very much for uh, participating in this class, continuing to study uh, the 12 apostles we're talking about. 12 were chosen, and we're looking at a study of the original apostles. In this particular lesson, we're going to look at James the Less, Simon the Zealot, Judas not Iscariot, and I've entitled this Faces in the Crowd. Uh, have you ever been to a, a, a large sporting event? Uh, I, I remember years ago, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go to a professional basketball game. And, and I was sitting in the arena, uh, kind of about halfway up, and, and all around me are thousands of people. I, I think the arena held 10,000 or more people. And it was a packed house. I, I was fortunate to have had tickets, and I was with a friend. And I, I remember sitting in that crowd and, and looking around and seeing all of these faces, and I, I didn't know anybody in that huge arena except for the person that was with me. And I thought, no one knows me either. No one, no one knows who I am in this huge crowd of people, and no one really cares who I am in this large crowd of people. And, and, and I, for a moment there, I was kind of overwhelmed uh, by a, a feeling of, of, wow, I'm just a face in the crowd here, and not even a recognizable face. And then I remembered, well, you know what? It's not about me. These people are not here because Dave Layton is here. They're here to watch the teams play basketball. Well, that, that's kind of the idea that I get as I, I look at these remaining apostles that, that were faithful to Jesus. Have you ever experienced being lost in a crowd? Uh, you, maybe you've been in one of those sporting events and you understand exactly what I'm saying. Uh, so, you know, we have the, these three men. Maybe at times they felt, we would think they would, uh, they're being lost in the crowd. Uh, but you know what? I, really and truly is, as we study these men, we think about these men, I, I don't think that thought really crossed their mind. Or if it did cross their mind, hey, wait a minute, you know, what about me? Uh, I, I don't think it stayed there very long. Uh, not everyone can be recognized as a champion. Uh, there are those who uh, receive acclaim for their deeds. But you know, in the kingdom of God, we do receive a crown of glory. We, we are champions because uh, not what we do or anything we have done, but because Jesus. It, it, it's that paradox, the more we give up for our Lord, uh, the more honor that comes our way because God loves us so much. You know, it's not about us, it's about the Lord. But interestingly, God makes it about us because of our service to the Lord. So in, in the kingdom of God, uh, we honor the Lord, we show Him to others, and because of that, God glorifies us. And praise God for that. So really, that's what marks the three men in this lesson. Uh, they might seem obscure and ordinary among the obscure and ordinary, but they're shining stars in the kingdom. Don't, don't ever discount these men because of their seeming obscurity. And by the way, that, that, you know, we're talking about lessons that we learn from these men. There are silent saints in our midst. There are people in our congregations that serve the Lord faithfully, we may not know what they do, but God knows what they do and God honors them for that and God glorifies them. There are several places in scripture uh, that teach us about God lifting up the humble. It, it, it's a requirement of us that we submit ourselves to the Lord and so many are doing that. And so that's what we see in these men. I, and, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here because we, we are going to look at, at uh, some information about these three, even though there's very little information, uh, there is some things we can learn from them. So that's where I wanna go with our lesson. Uh, let's, let's start by talking about, actually, James the Less is one of my favorite apostles. How would you like to go through life being called Joe the Less, or Mary the Less, or Dave the Least? Uh, you know, it, it's, just, it's just remarkable. But remember what Jesus said? He said, the one who is least in the kingdom would be greatest. And what makes us uh, least is because we're favoring the Lord and we're serving. And so we see James the less. That, that's actually a title of honor 
not necessarily of derision. Well, James the Less is, is named in Scripture only in the list of the apostles in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then in Acts. Uh, it, he, he is mentioned in Mark uh, 15, verse 40, as a kind of a secondary figure, as somebody who was also there. So it's interesting. I say a secondary figure, but the fact that he was also there means he was there. He was a part of it. He was active in things, even though it was not documented as such. But there is an interesting thing about uh, uh, James. Uh, he's also listed in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3, as the son of Alphaeus. He's also called that. If you'll note, Matthew was also called the son of Alphaeus. Now, it could be that James and Matthew were brothers. Nothing in Scripture really uh, distinguishes between these two men as son of Alphaeus. Uh, it doesn't show his relationship to Matthew as such. We simply don't know. But I find that fascinating. We do know Peter and Andrew uh, were brothers. James and John were brothers. So it's very possible that Matthew and James were brothers. We don't know. It's just not said there. But the fact that it does say the son of Alphaeus brings an interesting twist. It's not a major point, but it just it is interesting to me because it, it shows some of the internal dynamics that would be going on between the various apostles. Uh, uh, he, he's really best known as James the Less or James the Younger. The word less in the original language primarily means little or small in stature. Uh, it could also mean someone who's younger in age. Uh, most scholars think he received the name based on uh, comparison to the other James, the son of Zebedee, one of the sons of thunder, who was in that inner circle with Jesus. So we've got James, son of thunder, James the less. Uh, so that's again, a, a reasons why his name may have been such. Either way, it kind of gives us an image of James the less. It's an image of a man who was probably small, a shorter man uh, than others. He might have been young and quiet, and he seemed to stay mostly in the background. He's, he's kind of by himself. And truly by himself, he, he doesn't seem to be very influential. But that's okay, because it's God who we point to. We point to Jesus, the Son of God. That's what we want to show, not ourselves. We get ourselves out of the way. And so that's why I like James the less. He's a great example of what it means to live daily, even by name, pointing to Jesus. That's what's important. Don't think about me. Think about the Lord. That's what's important. You know, there's, there's no other mention in Scripture about James. Uh, he didn't write any of the books of the New Testament. We don't have any questions that he asked of Jesus. Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus doesn't put any questions to him directly as he did with some of the others. Jesus never condemned or, or said anything bad about James as an individual. There were times when Jesus chastised or rebukes or challenges all of the apostles collectively, but he doesn't single James out. James is just a silent servant. And everything James was a part of, the Lord knows about, even though we ourselves may not know. Well, James is not alone in his quiet service. Another apostle who is also hardly mentioned is out there, but he's a great example for us. I mentioned James, I'm sorry, Simon the Zealot earlier in, in relation to Matthew. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that again. Simon the Zealot is the 10th name apostle in Luke chapter 6, verse 15. So we're moving down the line, getting toward the end of the listing. He's number 11 in Matthew and Mark. Uh, some versions refer to him as Simon the Canaanite, or the, yeah, the Canaanite. Not, not a reference to Canaan necessarily or the village of Cana. It's, all, it, it's from the word uh, uh, that means to be zealous. So he's known as Simon the Zealot. So Simon was a man of strong beliefs and passions. Oh, remember I talked when we, we, we talked about uh, what Matthew teaches us about the great commitment 
uh, that, that, that um, strong beliefs and passions that Simon the Zealot would have would, would be a valuable tool for him and his commitment to the Savior. You know, the Zealots were an interesting group. Uh, and apparently, Simon was one of uh, a member of that, at least at one time. Uh, it, it was a political party or a political leaning known as the Zealots. Uh, they were more politically minded. Uh, they certainly hated the Romans passionately. They were dedicated to overthrowing them. Uh, they were extremists, would be the word that we, we might use today, radicals or extremists. Uh, they were uh, those who interpreted the law literally, and they despised anybody who believed different than them. If you didn't believe their way, you were wrong, and you needed to change. And, and sometimes uh, they would bring that about uh, by the death of someone. The zealots were known to have carried a knife so that they would always be ready to kill uh, a Roman person, or especially a Roman soldier, or someone who represented Rome or someone who worked with Rome, hence Matthew. Uh, they, they believed in the militant and violent uh, overthrow of the government. They were considered outlaws. Uh, some commentaries, by the way, uh, consider that Barabbas, the man who uh, uh, Jesus replaced, uh, at the crucifixion, that Barabbas may have been a zealot but, and, and was considered a militant and an outlaw. I don't know. That, that's speculation, but it's interesting. But the zealots believed only God had the right to rule the Jews. There, there's a lot of truth to that, but the way they went about that uh, was, was certainly uh, not the way God necessarily chooses us to act. They believed they were doing God's work by assassinating Roman soldiers, political leaders, those who worked for Rome, especially tax collectors. Uh, they were looking for a Messiah to overthrow Rome, establish the kingdom to its former glory. Now, because of that, I think the relationship between Matthew, the former tax collector, and Simon, the former zealot, must have been quite interesting. Imagine their discussions and, and uh, you know, talking about their former life, maybe even laughing at themselves a little bit and, and, uh, or shaking their head in wonder that how would God ever count them worthy, somebody who was a violent individual and somebody who was a tax collector and despised, and yet they found in themselves unity. They were brothers in the Lord. They were fellow soldiers in our Lord's army. They were, they were now colleagues, compatriots, serving the master. At one time, Simon would have gladly killed Matthew. Matthew would likely have turned Simon, pointed him out to the soldiers so that uh, they would have arrested him. But there they were. They stand as spiritual brothers, dedicated to Christ, spreading the gospel, worshiping, serving the same Lord, and serving each other now. What, a, what an amazing story that is. It really illustrates the transformational power of Jesus when, when we let him rule our lives. Well, our last apostle that remained faithful to our Lord shares the name of the betrayer. And, and we look at his life, we, we see that he's the opposite in that. He also remained faithful and dedicated to Jesus. Judas, not Iscariot. Judas, is, uh, as, uh, Judas, not Iscariot, was referred to in some commentaries as the trinomial apostle. In other words, he's got three names, trinomial. Uh, I've already son, shown in some of the others that we, we see uh, they're known as different things, different names for Matthew and Levi, Bartholomew and Nathaniel. Well, here we are with Judas, not Iscariot. Uh, he's referred to as, uh, by John as Judas, not Iscariot. I, I think in an effort to differentiate him from Judas the betrayer. That's in John chapter 14, verse 22. You know, the name Judas actually means Jehovah leads. But because Judas Iscariot was the betrayer, uh, it, it really has kind of lost that uh, connotation. The name Judas carries a very negative connotation. So it's Judas, not Iscariot, to make sure we don't, portray this man in, an, in, 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 in some sort of a negative way. In Matthew 10, verse 3, in the King James Version, we see the other names. Uh, he's referred to as Labaius, 
whose surname was Thaddeus. So you'll see him sometimes uh, in literature referred to by all of these. Well, let's talk about his mentions in Scripture, because again, there's some writings about all of these men outside of Scripture, but we need to focus on what Scripture says, because in Scripture, of course, is where the truth is. Uh, other than the list of the apostles in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then in Acts, we, we, uh, we see really only one mention in John chapter 14, verse 21. Uh, Jesus is revealing some more insight into his relationship with those who love and obey him. Uh, you know, those that love him keep his commandments. Those who love Jesus will be loved by God the Father. And, and in that narrative, as Jesus is speaking, Judas not Iscariot asks a very good question. And, and when, you know, as a teacher, sometimes you know what someone knows or doesn't know by the question that they're asking. And, and Judas, not Iscariot, reveals that to us. He asks a simple question for clarification. In verse 22 there, he says, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Uh, he, he was asking this from the view of someone who was thinking about and seeking an earthly kingdom, an earthly king. And so if you're going to be the ruler and all of this, why are we the ones seeing it and you're not showing it to the rest of the world? And we see a marvelous answer from Jesus in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. In other words, if you love God, you seek to obey God, you're going to know God. God's going to be revealed to you. So Jesus is seen by those who believe. Uh, we, we then help others believe. We help others see. That's how God has chosen to reveal himself. He reveals himself through Jesus. You've seen the Father, you've seen, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says. And then we take that. We show Jesus to the others. Jesus said, remember in the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew 5, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light to the world. And don't be hidden. You bring flavor. You, you, you bring light. But it's not us. We're showing Jesus to others. I, 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 I am amazed, I, honored, and humbled by God's plan. Not, not just the plan of salvation, but the plan of how we bring it to the world. God gives it to us, and we then reveal that plan to others. In all of the incidents of salvation uh, that we study in the book of Acts, and, and we've seen through history, uh, once, once God revealed his plan at Pentecost, from that point forward, and even in that moment, it was, it was us, followers of Christ, the disciples of Jesus, teaching it to others. Uh, Jesus always brings the one seeking salvation and the teacher together. And, and that's what we see throughout all of the book of Acts as the church begins to grow. God reveals his plan to others through us. What an amazing responsibility that is and what a joy it is that God counts us worthy and, and gives us that responsibility to teach others. And so that's why, that, that, that's why this question by Judas, not as scary, it was such a good question. How, how is it you reveal yourself to us and not the world? That's what we do. That's our mission. All right, so as we see, there's little mention of these three men in Scripture, uh, but there are lessons we can learn from them, things that, that, that we take away from this that, that help us grow. First of all, and, and this is such such an important lesson that I just have to remind myself about so many times. Uh, somebody rejects me and I might have my feelings hurt or I might feel like, oh man, I just, I'm tired. I, am I doing any good? I have to remember it's not about me. It's about the master. Being a servant of God is just not about us. It's all about showing Jesus, not only through our lives, but also through our words. Uh, we do that as Paul would say, it's so that God's power is seen. It's not about us. It's about the master. We always remember that our Lord is the master. We're the servants. Our singular focus is really summed up in our Lord's words in Matthew 26, 36 through 40. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, we're, we're, we're pointing others to God and we're, we're serving others. We're showing that love that God wants us to have. Uh, not a love that points to us, 
a love that puts others first, puts God's first, and, and then uh, those that we would say are our neighbors, those around us. Well, these men turned away from self. They turned to the Lord. All right, another lesson is these men teach us the glory of the ordinary. I love that expression. Somebody wrote a book years ago, The Glory of the Ordinary, and, and that's what these men are. They serve quietly in the background, always looking to do what the Lord asks. Sometimes, collectively, the apostles would follow reluctantly, not understanding. Um, that was at first, but then they would grow Jesus would explain, Jesus would teach, sometimes he would admonish, sometimes he'd kind of poke them a little bit, oh, ye of little faith, do you, do you just not understand? And, and uh, Jesus carried them along and they began to grow, they began to understand. And certainly then, as the Holy Spirit entered their lives, they grew and they continued to grow. And boy, what a lesson that is for us. Glory of the ordinary, they serve as standards as I've already said, for the countless Christians throughout the world, throughout history, that sometimes are overlooked because they're not up front. Uh, they're not out in front of everybody else. They're, they're not the great speakers and teachers and servants, but they are great servants. They're serving the master. Their greatness, though, is not in themselves. Their greatness is in how they point others to Jesus. And that's what these men show us, the glory of the ordinary. I love these guys. And, and they go quietly about you know, serving the Lord, obeying the Lord. They bring others to Him in ways known only to God, but they're known to God. So these men are great examples for us. And in doing that, the third lesson, these men express the durability of faith. It wasn't, it wasn't a one-time thing that was short-lived. It was their life. It was who they were. It, 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 they had to grow in it. But they did grow in it. We know that because they're, they're just counted among the faithful. While others left our Lord because of the difficulty of His teachings. When you read in John chapter 6, starting there in uh, around 60, uh, going through all of that, uh, John 6, especially 66, uh, they, like the other apostles, remained with Him. And what was going on there, Jesus was teaching some things that, that were very difficult. This, this was... This was uh, meat and potatoes. It was not chicken soup that they were taking. They were chewing on the, the meat, as, as Paul and Peter would express it, not the milk. And, and so uh, some people had difficulty with it. The Jewish leaders, uh, wait a minute, eat, eat his flesh? Well, what is that? And, and so they were having trouble taking that in. And many turned away from Jesus because of that. And, and, and then Jesus asked the question, are you gonna leave me too? Peter jumps in there and states what really I think the apostles were thinking. Jesus said, uh, who are we going to go to? You have the words of life. And so these apostles, especially these silent ones who were not recorded giving any kind of praise and everything and building them up by Jesus and others, these silent saints, as so many are, endured. They show the durability of faith that they had. And what a great lesson that is. Uh, we do know that they, like the apostles, had to learn the true nature of Jesus and his mission, but they did learn. They stayed with him, even though at times they may not have misunderstood. They may not have clearly known what's going on here. They may have had doubts, but they stayed with him. The durability of faith. They're counted, a number, they're counted among the number at, at Pentecost, in chapter 2 there of Acts, and they continue on proclaiming the message of Jesus to the world. Faithfulness is their greatest example and their greatest lesson to us. It's not about us. It's about our faith to Jesus. Well, let me conclude. Let's talk about again. These three men are not seen by literature or by us as giants in the faith because of our standards. You might say their most distinguishing mark was their obscurity. They're counted among the 12. They're counted among uh, faithful saints. But we don't see a lot going on that, that would bring adulation to them. Yet there they were, counted among the 12, handpicked for Jesus for a reason, because they were going to be instruments to carry the gospel to all the world. They were ever faithful. They allowed the Lord to change their life. 
And, and because of that, they're part of a wonderful group of men who are introduced the gospel to the world. They teach and encourage us to be faithful. I think these men collectively, we talk about songs they would love to sing. I think these men collectively would have loved the song, Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. See, it's not about me. It's about the Master. That's what these men teach us. Faithfulness to the Master. Well, this concludes this particular lesson. Uh, again, we have looked now at the 11 apostles that were faithful to Jesus. Well, next, we're going to look at the final member of the original apostles. We're going to look at Judas, the one who betrayed Christ. Friends, indeed, I thank you for your time and for your attention, for your desire to study and learn about Jesus, to become his disciple, or to continue in faithful service as the disciple. And remember, in all things, we give God the glory. Thank you.